Hey everyone. So I think we're going to get started. Well, we should show up any moment now. But um, today's reading group is going to be about uh, LSTMs and ImageNet. Um, the first comment trained on ImageNet, called um, also known as AlexNet. So uh, we're first going to start out with LSTMs, and we're just going to kind of go over the basics of the paper. If you've read um, the paper or the, uh, the Colic blog post, like it will be fairly prepared to maybe ask some questions. Um, and the idea is just we kind of recite stuff and you kind of probe into the different ideas. So we should be holding a weekly reading group for the, hopefully for the rest of the semester. Um, I did take some suggestions in the RSVP form. However, feel free to email me or Raul directly about more suggestions. Or um, I think we can open up a reading group Slack channel so that'll um, justify it. Everybody's like, every, everybody can just kind of throw in the papers they want to see there. And uh, yeah, we'll vote on um, what papers to read every week. Yeah. You ready? Huh? LSTMs? Uh, Alright, here's Raul with LSTMs. One sec. Cool. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I guess Phil's brief to you on kind of what the format for this is going to be. Since this is the first one, and these are very like general, well-known papers, um, for the sake of time, we're not going to be going into them that much in depth. Um, yeah, but like in, in future, there'll be like it'll be much more like you're, you're going to be expected to like really own the entire paper, like know all the knowledge and be able to answer like, almost any question on it. Fortunately, midterm season, so yeah, <laughs> uh, that paper's long. Um, okay, so I guess just like a simple like example is. Let's say you were in the, like, you want to predict, like, what word comes next, right? So with, like, a normal, just, like, convolutional neural net or, like, just a feed forward neural net, you would basically, like, tokenize, like, the words and just feed them through, right? And try and get a predictor. So, like, for example, like, if you just, in some, in some arrangement in a paragraph, you had those words, right? Um... When you try to predict what word comes next, it would only have like one word as reference. So it would only be thinking about like what comes after the word dog. Like it could be eight, eat, um, eat. No, no, chased, um, <laughs> barked. We don't know like what comes next. We have like no like um, yeah. We have no notion of context. We don't. We only know like that one data point. Maybe you can we limit can't. it to like putting a verb or something afterward and saying like fill in a verb here, but yeah, still, that but in like, and of itself does not dictate. Yeah, we can't like way. predict really what comes next. Like it's hard. It's also not ideal. Yeah. So, I guess like if you guys read the blog post, it was unfortunately down today because just like for some reason GitHub's fucked. Yeah, DN the um, DNS experienced some like DDoS. Yeah. DDoS. Yeah. But if you go to like Slack, I'd made like a reading group like public channel today, there's a link to like an archived version of that blog, of the LSTM blog, and you guys can read it. Like, it's you can put um, up right now. I think it's up actually now, GitHub fixed the oh, DNS yeah. stuff, so it, maybe you can just go straight there, but um, either way, it both work, so. Uh, but yeah, so this is from the blog, um, but basically like they had a really like nice quote at the beginning, humans don't start their thinking from scratch every second, and as you read the essay, um, that blog post, you understand like each word based on the understanding, like of the words that came before, like everything that's been in the essay before that point, and like you don't like throw away everything and just like start from scratch again, like what you were do what what you saw before, like you don't only have that one word as context. You have memory of what came before. Your thoughts have persistence. Um, so yeah, I guess just a little bit like on persistence. I mean, the textbook definition is the continu the continued or prolonged existence of something. Um, and that's essentially what we want to do with RNNs and LSTMs. We want to be able to like, like we want to be able to like take knowledge that you learned at one point and have it persist for like all time or like for some amount of time. Like we want you to be able to like remember past events and be able to internalize the learning that you get from that. Cause like the way like humans, or like, like the Pavlovian reinforcement with dogs. Like they learned at one point that the bell means a good or a bad thing, and they're gonna remember that for like the rest of their life. Um, but yeah, persistence. 
So like I said before, like fully connected nets are not good at persistence. They only have like a very limited like knowledge of the problem. They don't have any outside context. It's just like what you give them. They have no way of like remembering what came before. So for like, if these were three different words, like put in order, like you could do some creative stuff to make it like learn on those three words. But most likely what you're gonna do with just a fully connected net is you're gonna predict an outcome for each one of those three words. And realistically, and that like set of three, it doesn't represent anything yep. uh, like we can see in the real world. Like yeah, we might so see like arbitrarily long sentences and yeah, like, that so would be encoded. Fully words. connected nets by themselves, not great at persistence, not great at like predicting what comes next or like, uh, yeah, stuff like that. Um, so how do we achieve persistence? So at the most basic level, we can do this with RNNs, um, which basically just takes the output that you gave, so it takes the learning that it just gave, uh, that it just had, and it basically puts it back into itself to archive for later use. Um, and so this H of T kind of acts as, as is like the moving memory of the network itself. So it encodes yeah. some kind of like a yeah. higher a hierarchical order of things it's seen already. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, like it looks a little complex, but like just. At its simplest level, this is all it's doing. You can like unroll it completely, and it just looks like a normal net. It's just the way that the outputs are shaped is different. Like, it's just a matter of rearranging your matrix multiplication to get it in that format. Um, but yeah, it's essentially like a series of fully connected nets, and that's why it's great. Like, it's very simple and very easy to implement in practice. However. There are some shortcomings with RNNs. With vanilla RNNs. With van yeah. So it works like really good when there's like a small gap, uh, like between the relevant information and like like it works when there's a small gap between like what you just learned and what you want to predict, right? So like for window size like four or something, it's really good. Because like it's able to like completely like it's it's very able to like completely express all the knowledge learned in like those last four time steps, but that's it. Like it can only learn like how much like it can only learn like in very small times, uh, in very small like time spans. Um, and like an example like from like the reading of a case where it's bad is like let's say you say I grew up in France, you have a hundred words, like just like after that, a block of text, and then comes I speak fluent, and you want to predict what word comes next. You know he grew up in France, and he says like, I speak fluent something. Like, we would guess like French, but an RNN, because it just had like all like those multiplications, like that just happened, like since there was so much information put through it, like that information from so far back is gonna be lost. It's gonna be obfuscated by the information that it just learned. So this is a problem with RNNs um, because of like the frequency of like matrix operations like it loses like expressive like it loses like information very fast so how do we combat that so by modifying it slightly we can have something called long short long short-term memory um, so essentially what this is is instead of just the simple like one layer just multiply the previous uh, the previous output into the input. Um, instead of just a very simple like just single layer, we have instead four layers. All right, and each one of these interacts in a very specific uh, specific way with all the other layers to achieve this notion of like long uh, of like of memory, I guess, or like our notion of memory. So first. There's the forget gate. Um, so like almost all LSTMs. Wait, what? I'm just seeing with the lower lights in front to make it easier to see the projectile. Yeah, oh, right, just, just keep going. Yeah, you're good. Oh, yeah, that kind of sucks. Sorry, guys. Just keep yeah. Going. Um. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah. So in like, there's tons of variations of LS LSTMs. A lot of people do their own like crazy combinations of gates, but. On, in almost every single case, there's a forget gate, right? <laughs> just just okay. don't mind it. <laughs> so in every single one, there's a forget gate. 
Do you make me mind? <laughs> uh, so in every case, there's this forget gate, right? And the goal of forget gate is to um, to help us like learn, or when we train, like when we train the forget gate layer, what we're training on is we're like basically giving it an understanding of what is important information for my task, for my purpose. Like let's say it's predicting stock information, right? Then you're going to want to remember, like I guess, like one thing it could learn is like percent changes greater than a certain number, right? Because like if it goes up a lot, you want that, like that's good. Like you want your stock predictor, like to be able to capitalize on that information that sun spike can make, like a definitive yes, I want to buy, like right now, uh, kind of decision. So okay, so you train the forget gate um, to basically like. Um, regulate what new information get, uh, gets added or what gets forgotten, I mean. Um, and then the next important part is an input gate and a candidate value generator. So the candidate value generator is your basic, like, when that's like the most basic, like, convolu like, like, fully connected layer or like a convolution or something like that. It's basically just, you're learning what to output for just like one small point in time. It's, it, it's just like a normal fully connected net, basically. However, you want to determine what values from that new information, from that new output, from that new initial multiplication that you want to propagate up into the state. Um, so the previous one was determining what like information to forget. This one, these two layers in combination, their goal is to decide what, to, what, what information to remember instead. Um, so yeah, so the sigmoid layer there basically just regulates um, regulates what values are gonna like what indices need to be updated and to what degree they need to be updated, and then the other layer generates actual values to put in. Um, and these two layers in common, uh, these three layers in combination, they help to deal with like random perturbations, like. Um, Let's say, let's say in that um, in that France example, right? Um, let's say that what you're training on is something like a net to recognize person's nationalities. Then you wouldn't care that like that they were like a lawyer or something, right? Like that doesn't necessarily help you like understand like where they like what nationality they hail from because like all all nations have lawyers. Or, that, like, oh, no. or there's a Donalds in my nation. All nations have McDonald's. Like that's that does that wouldn't help it do its job. Is that because they're like um, kind of voting for two, two yeah. the same things? Yeah. So it's similar to like an ensemble. But kind of yeah, ensemble. they kind of like help regulate each other, and in like it, when they're combined in tandem, they like really help deal with like just like extraneous information that's not relevant to your problem that you don't really care about remembering. Um. Yeah. So updating state, the way it happens specifically is you take the sigmoid layer that was telling you what values to update and you multiply it by like values generated, obviously. And then over here, the sigmoid layer is what to forget and what degree to forget things to. Um, so then you multiply by that and then it obviously will forget information from here, previous iterations and then you add in new information to those values. I wish I had like formulas in another model. Are they really, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, okay, so for actually outputting values, um, it takes the current state that you just created from adding, right? And then it trains basically a layer. Wait, don't worry about it. Okay. Then it trains basically a layer that outputs, like it tells you like what actually to do, whether to buy or sell or like don't sell based on the current state. Um, and then on top of this like HT or whatever, this output, like, you can then stack layers of convolutions, you can do like basically whatever you want afterwards. Or just keep doing and then, right. Or yeah, you can keep doing them and take all the results in the end, but you can also just like, like just do like, else, yeah, you yeah. can just connect something to like the last output that you get from the, from the end. Cool. Um, 
So yeah, this is like a little application, I guess, um, from the paper, if you read it, the long one. Uh, so this is like the traditional test for recurrent neural nets, like as a benchmark, um, like in, if you want like to make a generalized like new sort of LSTM, like combine the layers in a different way. This is, a, this is like the classic benchmark test. And basically the goal is to learn this thing called Reaver grammar, right? And like, I, it's just basically like a sim some dude's understanding of the like of the English grammatical language. He kind of broke it down into like a finite state machine of like subject, verbs, predicates, and that kind of stuff. But the goal is basically using this finite state machine that this dude made hella days ago. Uh, basically, try and predict what word will come next, or like try and do like some like yeah, just some simple prediction. Um, and basically, like use your LSTM or whatever, and try to also output what comes next, and then just kind of like see which of the two get better performance. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I guess like time for questions on this, like. Sure, what's up, Brent? Uh, so I know that the LSTM paper is around something like 20 years old. It's, it's, it's 19. 19. Oh, okay, yeah. around, yeah. around 20 years old. It's from 97. Yeah. It's super um, dense. So is, is it still pretty much the state of the art in terms of RNNs, or have there been improvements? Well, uh, see, actually the thing is the vanilla LSTM actually works pretty well. Uh, vanilla RNN, not so much, because it has like that very short-term memory problem. But for things like when you just want to use like the last few, um, I guess the last few frames, or last few like things of input, then it works really well. So for something like, say, predicting optical flow, RNNs will work really well because just like you don't care what happened a hundred like video frames back, you only care like what happened immediately. So RNNs work really well there. LSTMs work better for like text analysis and stuff. And then there's more specific like combinations of layers of those like internal stuff, like the predicting yeah, like, and connecting gates. Like there's the one that um, actually Max's group is using. I think Barsha may know a little bit about <laughs> it. Yeah. Where they're using uh, gated recurrent units. Oh, a GRU. No, a yeah. GRU is also a very simple one. It's kind of like an RNN and an LSTM. It's it's, it, is they just change up some layer inside of the yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like a GRU is another modified RNN slash LSTM. But like some crazy combinations of LSTMs will like have all these layers also be connected to output. like. Just various perturbations. Instead of like, instead like someone might put a tan H layer here. Like if you want to use RNN for um, like image generation. I mean, typically actually you put it probably here, but whatever. Does, but then, does, does that usually show like those any of those I guess tweaks to the standard vanilla R L uh, LSTM? Do they really show any significant improvement? Um, only in like specific cases. I think there's a survey paper that finds a few like of 10,000 potential RNN architectures that are some kind of variation of this. Mm -hmm. um, that shows a few of them are better than LSTMs, but again, it's probably more specific domain kind of problems that it does really well at. It definitely, I think there's a link in the LSTM Cola blog, which um, yeah. mentions this specific paper. So it's worth checking out. And it's a survey from relatively like recent too. So it like has a lot of LSTMs up until like 2012 and 2014. But the thing is like there hasn't been any major breakthrough in this sort of area. I guess like one kind of breakthrough isn't in the LSTM itself. It's what happens like before the LSTM. So like some people will use like instead of like instead of like I guess putting like a convolution layer right in front of this input, they'll use like a conditional random field which can act on multiple inputs at once and kind of take like so it's it's similar to an LSTM in that it kind of like captures memory but it doesn't only capture memory it like also knows about the future since like it's it's kind of like it's kind of like a baby Bayesian net I guess it's a way of like it's an analogy um, and it just goes like in front of like the RNN like your sliding window RNN and then I guess that's relatively re recent. Like Trevor Darrell's field used it for like um, a team used it for like video captioning like two years ago. Um, but yeah, there's not been many like astounding breakthroughs in the architecture. If that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions about those teams? All right, um, we can move on to ImageNet then. Yeah. Cool. So these are like. <laughs> So these papers from today, they're kind of just like very, um, 
they're kind of like the most cited in the field currently. They're kind of like papers that everyone should know. Um, that's why like, and and like there's, they don't like do anything like very like niche or anything. They're very general algorithms. So that's like why I guess we won't be going into them t in too much in depth this week. But in future weeks, like the papers that we'll be going over are more like niche application kind of papers. So those will be much more in depth than these. Okay. Yeah. Well, but uh, ImageNet classification with deep CNNs is kind of like the emerging um, CNN paper. And a lot of image CNNs that came afterwards definitely cite this paper. So I think like it's like pretty. something ridiculous. Like it's either 2,600 or like 6,200 citations. So ridiculous like number of in citations. In the last four years alone. Yeah. Um, and so the basic idea is that we're, um, oh, I guess I go over the cool stuff real quick. So first of all, it kind of demonstrates an effectiveness of relus. You can see it. Uh, d demonstrates the effectiveness of relus and training. So rectifier linear units are just like an alternative activation. I'll jump into that in a second. Um, and then it's like the first time confnets are applied to the ImageNet competition, or at least successfully. And if you note that um, in 2010, he mentions that the best performer is like 47% um, or something like that on um, best predictions, and then they drop 10% in, in error rate. So they like make a huge bounce from that period of time. And then you'll notice the next year, so they're pretty much the only like continent uh, solution in the 2012 competition, but in 2013, pretty much all of the um, solutions are related to continents. So it's like, it's pretty revolutionary that this happened. And then um, there's some cool stuff with the distributed GPU architecture, as well as like how they actually attacked overfitting. All right, so I'll jump into it. So first thing I just want to talk about is the ImageNet data set. Basically, it's just a huge database with a bunch of nouns connecting to a bunch of images. Um, as you can see here, there's some examples. This is actually pulled from the paper itself, so if you read it, you may recognize this. Um, this is basically just giving predictions for each kind of uh, picture here. So, um, like at the top left, you see a mite. Bottom right, it's a Madagascar cat, or I, I guess that's supposed to be like a lemur or something. Um, and then there's a little bit of confusion in the cherry as well as maybe the mushroom as well. Actually, the grill is probably the more the two confusing images, but you can see that they're both kind of classifying pretty well. The point is though, it just has a bunch of images. They're pretty high res, which is not really um, to, which was barely seen before 2010, but when they started doing the ImageNet challenge. And um, that just makes it a lot harder to make an algorithm that does like, like properly processes it because you need a lot of parameters, which in and of itself is like computationally expensive. So I uh, just wanted to give you a quick convnet demo. So um, for those of you who are familiar with neural nets, at least you're you're familiar with like the um, complete connectedness. It's uh, they call them dense layers, and they're basically like uh, actually I don't have them here. But if you, uh, if you were to draw it out, every single neuron is connected to every single other neuron in the next layer, and so, and so on. So you basically have full connectedness. Um, however, in the ConfNet, they actually, uh, they, uh, I guess the problem with the dent, normal dense networks is that the uh, fully connectedness requires you to input like a vector, so just like a single a column. However, an image has all this like spatial information, which is kind of lost when you put it into a vector. So you have no more information about what stuff is next to each other. And then, um, additionally, these dense networks, especially when you're inputting in, um, an image, become huge. They become like a huge number of parameters. So the convolutional layer, because of how it actually processes the image, reduces the number of parameters significantly. So instead of having to have like, um, let's say an image is 300 by 300, I think you can, um, so if an image is 300 by 300, you input a vector that's like, what, 90,000? 90, um, 90,000 in length. And uh, thus you'd have like 90,000 to like whatever number of um, uh, neurons in the next layer. So you'd have like, uh, what would that be? Like 90,000 times, say like 400 parameters if there's like 400 in the next layer. And um, that would be freaking amazingly huge. However, the convolutional net just requires you to have like the convolutional filter uh, parameters and then however many filters you have as well. So, um, yeah, let me open up this demo real quick. It basically just runs the um, convolutional operation. As you can see here, they basically take an image, which is marked by this blue box here, and they'll run this convolution operation, which is basically just taking like a filter, like a, pretty much a square, and it goes over the um, entire matrix and just like takes the dot product over all those values. So um, you can see this filter with W0, that could be like the first weight, and or the first uh, 
section of the filter. And as you can see, they're kind of just scanning over all of the image there, taking dot products, passing it over to this output volume. And then they do the same thing with these, uh, this uh, W1 filter as well. All concatenates into here. And so uh, by doing this operation, you're a you're, you are able to um, preserve your spatial, um, your spatial dimensions and kind of the arrangement of all the items within the image itself. So it's like a pretty, pretty cool algorithm in that sense. Re it works really well with images. Yeah, and so uh, in addition to this convolutional layer that you have at the very beginning, you have this pooling layer. And so basically it takes, just takes the max of some sections of the, um, the image itself. So let's say we have these, um, this corner right up here. So you take, we have 1156, and then it just maxes all of that into a six. It takes the biggest value inside of all this. So it basically just finds a filter, and then um, uh, basically takes out the max of all those. Now, there's some kind of controversy over where, whether or not max pooling is like a viable option, but at least in this paper, it seemed like a very good, um, very good layer. It added some accuracy, and they were able to do cross-validation to say whether or not it was actually useful or not. There's been some talk about whether you could just do the same thing with convolutional layers. I didn't really dive into that, so I'm not, I'm not really an expert on that, but I know that there's some kind of contention on whether or not max pooling is good. Um, and then here's the final entire out, um, output of the layer. I mean, a uh, convnet. So you basically have your input layer here, which is just like the image. They split it up into the separate RGB cha uh, RGB channels into kind of like three dimensions of this tensor. And so um, then what they do, they take the uh, convolutional layer here, where they basically pass in a um, a four by four by three tensor, so the rank three tensor that goes through the entire image, and it just takes this dot product, constructs this filter, and as you can see here, they do the max pooling again with like a similar size filter. And this dimension down here is just like the number of filters that they actually run through for um, each layer. So you can just run like any number of filters. And then backpropagation is able to handle the, um, the kind of differentiation between all the different filters so that they become, they could become specialized and may encode things like edges um, or maybe some kind of color features of the image itself. Um, definitely worth checking out this link that I posted here. It's just the, um, C the Stanford CS231N, whatever, the Convolutional Neural Network course that the Stanford hosts. It's all online, it's pretty great. I definitely learned a lot from it. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna move on to the paper architecture itself. So uh, based on what kind of hardware they're working with, they decided to split up their, their architecture into two separate pieces. So as you can see, they, they take a similar like Convolutional Neural Net, like, um, made by tensor operations and they split them up into uh, two separate blocks, I guess. So they can uh, simultaneously um, analyze two different parts of the network. And this was because their GPUs that they had at the time were uh, like GTX 580s with three gigabytes of RAM. And so they were trying to fit this entire huge network on one of them and it just didn't work. Like nowadays we could definitely throw one of these on, throw um, like an entire network like this onto a single GPU. But back then it wasn't feasible. However, this does give us like a nice idea of what scaling a uh, convolutional neural network would look like, what, or it does look like. And so uh, we can apply this for problems that may be potentially, may require like this number of parameters or, well, in um, an equivalent amount toward, an equivalent like limit of our like hardware right now, we can maybe split it up so that the size of the parameters are greater than eight, gig eight gigabytes, which is like kind of the hard limit right now. <clears throat> And as, as you can see, we still have these, um, we still have these conv nets, and then a max pooling layer afterwards. Actually, wait, I think these are max pooling. And then this is a conv layer, they have two in a row. And then they split it up into these two separate parts. The idea on splitting them up is just to limit the communication between the two GPUs, because communication between G two GPUs is more expensive than communication on a single GPU, as you'd expect. And eventually they break down and put it into these dense layers. So they eventually, um, the key thing about conv nets is that they actually end up using like a regular dense neural network with like fully connectedness at the very end, which is what we see here. Um, so additionally, as I mentioned earlier, the paper uses rectifier linear units. So at the time, uh, ReLUs were not really like a industry standard or a deep learning standard. Um, we definitely relied a lot more on sigmoid activation functions. So uh, these would be uh, functions like the logistic function, which you can see is like this S-curve, as well as the tanh function, which uh, Raul actually mentioned. There's some problems with this in the context of deep learning 
because rectifier linear units are, uh, actually regular sigmoid units have this saturation section. If you notice this very end piece, or on um, both ends, uh, it pretty much goes to one. So if any values end up, like, if any z's are like in this end range of the logistic function or uh, tan h function, they'll basically saturate. They won't be able to get any, they won't be able to get very far. And in the paper, they actually post a, uh, a picture of the content they were training on the, um, on the training times using these different activation functions. And not only does the like, computational complexity decrease when you use a rectifier linear unit, but the actual t um, number of epochs you need, the number of training sets you need to get to a reasonable um, training value, it, training error, uh, is actually much, much faster with a rectifier linear unit because it doesn't have the saturation point. As you can perceivably see, it just kind of goes off to infinity. Um, and just to take a step back, the function here is like max, zero, and z, I think. So max, so it's basically like, if it's less than zero, then it's just gonna be zero. If it's more than zero, it's gonna be just a, a linear function. Cool. And uh, another thing that I thought was pretty cool in this paper, about this paper was that they did some really clever data augmentation. So the ImageNet uh, classification problem basically gives you 1.2 million um, data points, but it turns out that those points were not really good at generalizing. So uh, what they what they would do to add to add some um, extra training data so they would avoid overfitting is that they they created uh, image translations and horizontal reflections. They basically randomly chose subsections of the image and they would decide to like tran like move it across the um, field of view. Additionally, they would like flip it over across the center for, as a horizontal reflection is. And they were able to do enough of these to increase the data set by uh, 2048, or to the, two to the 11th, which is like a pretty big increase, and definitely uh, uh, reduced a lot of their overfitting. Additionally, because um, objects can exist in different kind of lighting conditions and lumi illuminations, they did this uh, alteration to other images with um, by messing with the RGB channels. The exact formula is listed in the book. It's like um, I don't remember exactly what it is, but I think they take like the covariance matrix and take the like eigenvectors and then modify the um, the specific like scaling of each eigenvector of the covariance matrix. Didn't really dive into that that much, but if you're curious about that, it's in the paper, so you can find out a little bit more about that. Basic idea though, it just tries to emulate what different lighting conditions would do to an object. Um, and finally, they added this uh, method called dropout. The basic idea for dropout is that you give each neuron in the network, if, uh, in the actual dense part of the network. So if you remember back from this slide, um, the dense part is the, the part right here. This is just a normal P4 neural network. What they, what they would do in this section is that they would assign each neuron a 0.5 probability of not being in the, um, the training, or essentially they set its output to zero. And so um, what, they, what this would do, it would kind of prevent any of the neurons from having a dependency on any other neurons, so they wouldn't be like training together, uh, which would often lead to overfitting. Um, and then this also, this gives you an opportunity to like make an ensemble learning method, which would normally be like t uh, combining a bunch of different, um, per, a bunch of different like machine learning algorithms. It lets you do that on the same per, uh, network. And especially with something so expensive to compute, like the convolutional neural network in this case, which took them like five to six days to run, being able to do dropout is just a quick way and a quick and cheap way to make like ensemble learning or at least get the benefits of ensemble learning. So it's a, it's a pretty nice, um, pretty nice, I guess, heuristic to follow. And um, the great thing is that it's able to learn some robust features. And then at test time, when they're actually uh, outputting their accuracy, they just keep, um, they use all the neurons instead of like probabilistically removing some, but then they just have their outputs. And this is supposed to, this is justified because they're it's as if they're a geometric distribution. And so um, there's a little bit more discussion in the paper about that if you're curious. Oh, yeah, I guess that's it for me. Um, yeah, and so uh, in regards to performance, um, the exact numbers of how well they did was on the top one and top five test error rates. Top one being like they're able to predict the um, they're able to predict the first one correctly. So um, for specifically container ship, you could you could guess that its probability is like really high. However, on something like 
However, something like a mushroom, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit uh, on edge. You're not really sure what the exact label should be. Uh, so on the top one error rate, it was able to do 37.5%, and it got a 17% error rate on top five. Um, the best one in the 2010 competition was 47.1% for top one and 28.2% for top five. So both both experienced like a 10% drop in error rate, which is pretty solid. Um, yeah, let me see. So overall, a uh, pretty good example of how the convolutional neural net w is able to perform very well. There's definitely been a lot of modifications to the convolutional neural network uh, paradigm since then, but this is definitely the one of the pivotal papers towards applying convolutional neural nets for images and image data sets. So if anybody has any questions, I can take them there. No questions? No, okay. Cool. All right, thanks for coming. <clears throat>
some MLP things, I think, and like sometimes they they actually even use like denoising. Uh, it depends. I guess it depends what you're doing it on. Like, let's say, um, let's say maybe you're doing it on like the manifold of the uh, <laughs> the the NLP or something like that. Like, I bet you could you could get like a similar similar translation because you're just going across a manifold. But are you necessarily doing that when you're dealing with NLP? Yo, what if you what if you connect like an LSTM to a comnet, right? Oh like God. maybe, <laughs> I mean, yeah. just throwing yeah. it out there though. Like maybe you would be after the LSTM layer. Yeah, they do that. That's they, you learn like comnet embeddings, kind of like word to vec style embeddings. So, so whatever the LSTM does with like the spaces and stuff, maybe it could be some kind of like manifold like translation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I don't know. Because like the, the one I the the, the group of query thing, it's like it's trying to like add different types of kernels and filters. To other types of invariances like rotations and flips. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys done with your stuff? Yeah.